Uh, thanks, Doron. Look, I just must say in my own defence, John Best did meet, beat me at golf a couple of weeks ago, but he threw my putter in the water on the first hole, so I couldn't use my putter. <laughs> and he only just beat me, I might add. I'm going to briefly discuss just some broad principles of shoulder replacement surgery. Uh, the indications for a joint replacement in the shoulder is severe, unremitting pain that's not responsive to non-operative treatment, loss of active and passive movement, and interference with the activities of daily living. What has to be appreciated is a shoulder replacement is not nearly as robust as a hip or a knee replacement. The results of shoulder replacement uh, from a patient's point of view are not as good. So the patients are not happy. If you do have a shoulder replacement, you're in that older age group, and one of the things most shoulder replacements rely on is an intact rotator cuff. And as we all age, our rotator cuff becomes weaker, it becomes less functional, and it eventually tears. And as the rotator cuff tears, the shoulder replacement fails. So about 20% of people who have a total shoulder replacement have that replacement fail within the first 10 years, not due to a problem with the insertion of the replacement, but due to rotator cuff failure. Furthermore, if you do have a replacement of any sort, you can't go back to excessive sports. You can play a bit of golf, you can play bowls, but you can't go back to the gym. You can't go back to a heavy manual job or the uh, replacement will fail. And as John mentioned, a revision of a shoulder replacement has a 25% patient satisfaction. Now, I'm not saying success from a surgeon's point of view, but from patient satisfaction point of view. So we need to get a history and examination. Everybody needs a plain X-ray. I get an MR arthrogram to assess the rotator cuff. And if there is significant bony pathology, I get a three-dimensional CT scan. You can see on the top slide, there's gross erosion of the uh, glenoid, and you, the glenoid component is where this often fails from a replacement point of view. So if the rotator cuff survives, the failure occurs at the glenoid, and we need to try and get a stem in that uh, little vault of the glenoid. And you can see in the uh, slide at the bottom a picture of what we term cuff tear arthropathy, where the patient has a massive rotator cuff tear, and you can tell that by the complete loss of greater tuberosity to a chromial distance that's marked with the arrow with secondary osteoarthritis. So I get a three-dimensional CT scan and an MR arthrogram, and you can see the glenoid on the slide on your right is retroverted. The whole back of the glenoid is uh, chiselled out. That's, we call that a B2 glenoid, and that's a very, very difficult glenoid to reconstruct. You can see it also to a lesser extent uh, in the MR arthrogram on your left. So the aim of the operation from a technical point of view is to get that stem of the glenoid component, which is marked with the blue arrows on your right, into the vault, which is a very small bit of glenoid that you can see in the slides on the left. And if you can't get that to fit in, you're in big trouble. The humeral component is never really a problem. Once you've got it fitted in and the replacement works, then you've got to worry about the ageing rotator cuff. So as a surgeon, we have many choices. Do we do a hemiarthroplasty? Do we do a total shoulder replacement? And if we do a shoulder replacement, do we use a glenoid that is metal-backed or that is uh, all polyethylene? Do we do a hemiarthroplasty, a total shoulder replacement, 
or a reverse shoulder replacement? Well, here's the simple paradigm. If the rotator cuff is intact and of good quality, if the patient is under 50 years of age, what will probably happen is the glenoid component won't last him his lifestyle or her lifestyle, and a 50-year-old person is more active than a 70-year-old person. So you should try and do an operation, if you have to do it, under duress, that doesn't involve replacing the glenoid, just the humeral head. So we do what's called a resurfacing, we just resurface the humeral head or do a hemiarthroplasty and later down the line, when the glenoid wears out and their pain recurs, we then try and do a total shoulder replacement. So in the others who have an intact and good rotator cuff, we do a total shoulder replacement where we replace the glenoid and the humeral head unless there is significant glenoid retroversion and then we might consider because of stability issues what's called a reverse replacement. Now 10 years ago about 10 percent of the total shoulder replacements done around the world were reverse replacements. In 2016 over 60 percent are. We're becoming better at it the technology is improving and they may last a lot longer because you don't need a rotator cuff with a reverse replacement. And what happens if you have a look at that picture on your right, the, essentially the glenoid component, which is a sphere, pushes the humeral component laterally and downwards. It allows the deltoid to lift the arm up. It's what we call a more constrained prosthesis in that it's less likely to dislocate or sublux and you're not relying on the rotator cuff. In addition, if you have a retroverted glenoid, you can put it in in retroversion and it won't dislocate out the back because the prosthesis is more constrained. And this is what we can expect. On your left, there's a slide of a lady who had a total shoulder replacement. She never gets full movement, but she gets her arm up to about 140 degrees of active elevation, and she's happy with that. She can do most of the things she needs to do. And the slide on your right is a lady with a reverse replacement, and she can get about 110 degrees. Remember, she does not have a rotator cuff. She's relying on the deltoid. And also she's very happy, but often they're a little bit weak um, and weaker than normal. So what's the future hold? Well, we're getting cleverer. We now have what's called patient-specific instrumentation in that we send a CT scan of the patient's shoulder and they build us a little model that you can see in the slide on your left at the bottom which allows us to get the uh, glenoid uh, stem right down the middle of the glenoid. And every patient has a specific instrument designed for them that's unique to their anatomy. So we usually, if we use that, never miss. And if you can see the second slide on your left, that's a patient who had a very retroverted glenoid. And the clever uh, people in uh, Italy created a metal glenoid to compensate for the retroversion. So there's a new prosthesis that is being tested on the market made out of a material called pyrocarbon. And pyrocarbon has some unique properties that have hydrophilic uh, properties on the ceramic type stem and it pushes the humeral head away from the glenoid so there's no together, they spring apart. You only need to replace the humeral head, you don't need to replace the glenoid. It lasts forever, supposedly, and it functions very well and it doesn't wear like the normal replacements. So that's where we're heading, and I suspect in the next 10 years we'll either be doing that or reverse replacements in people who don't have rotator cuffs. Thank you.